Hi everyone, welcome back to CSC 348. Today we're going to be talking about functions, which is I think the last major discrete object that we're really going to talk about throughout this entire class. But also I would say it's one of the more important objects in the field of computer science. So really functions are going to dominate a lot of our topics in CSC 340, especially once we get to the back half of the quarter. And honestly, there's a lot of really cool things that uh, we'll be able to do with them. So hopefully this will provide a good introduction to what a function is. And then later on, we'll get into why they're so just awesome. So I would imagine by now that you're all very familiar with the term function from just programming languages in general. And that's not an accident. A lot of what computer science really is is about applying processes in order to solve general versions of problems without necessarily knowing all of the specific details up front. So the form that functions serve in all the programming that you've done so far is that functions are a process that transform some set of inputs into a certain output of a certain type. And that's still how we will view functions in this class. Although I want to encourage the view of functions as more like sort of an object that actually does the transformation rather than just some abstract process. So a function, we'll consider a function to be sort of an object that performs the transformation. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We have a lot of math to talk about with regards to functions, so let's get right into that. So the first thing we need to talk about when we're talking about functions is something called the ordered n-tuple. So this is another discrete structure, and you can think of it as sort of being a set that is ordered. So we describe an ordered n-tuple using parentheses like this instead of curly braces. The elements of that ordered n-tuple could still be whatever mathematical object we wanted to, just like a uh, set. But in this case, we say that it's an ordered collection. So it's a grouping of objects where the order does in fact matter. So in this case, we'll have a sub 1 is the first element, a sub 2 is the second element, and so on and so on, all the way until we get to a sub n as the nth element. And something that's actually important to know is that repetition is allowed. So you are allowed to have repeated elements in an ordered n-tuple, whereas you weren't able to do that with a set. Now, an ordered n-tuple is still a discrete object, much in the same way that a set is a, d is a discrete object, because of the fact that its size is a natural number. So you can have an empty n-tuple, a 1-tuple, a 2-tuple, all the way up through some n-tuple, and that n will always be a natural number. So basically, between any, say, 5-tuple and a 6-tuple, there is always a space of 1 between tuples of those size. So we have basically a bunch of discrete structures here. So here's an example graph that I just whipped up. What we have is the vertex set v1, v2, v3, and the edge set containing the edges v1, v2, v3, v1, v3, v2. So when we would describe this graph, we would say that g equals the ordered pair containing v and e. Now I want to go into a little bit why we're using this ordered pair notation for our graph. And really, this is just so that when a reader is looking at a graph and sees two sets that are both being used to describe a graph, we can know immediately that this is the vertex set and this is the edge set. So if we happen to switch this ordering around, say G equals E and V, then by our understanding of how we define graphs, by the uh, standard convention of, convention of defining a graph as containing a vertex set and an edge set. This would instead be interpreted as the vertex set, and this would be interpreted as the edge set. And that would cause a lot of confusion because all of a sudden, well, these don't look like vertices, and these certainly do not look like edges. So it's part of our convention of when we define a graph to do the vertex set first and then the edge set, which is why we use this ordered pair notation here. Now, it doesn't look super problematic to have it like this when we've named our graph our edge set E and a vertex set V. But it's important to note that not every vertex and edge set may be labeled this easily. So if we have something like rather than V, we have A, and rather than E, we have B, 
then saying g equals a b, the fact that we're using this ordered pair notation, this immediately tells the reader, okay, well, a is the vertex set here, and b is the edge set, even though they're not labeled v and e. So that's one reason why this ordered pair notation is really important for graphs. Another reason is when we're talking about directed edges. So we're going to take a closer look at the edge v1, v2 here. This is an ordered pair notation with v1 being the first vertex and v2 being the second vertex. And it's become general practice for when we're talking about graph edges that we use this ordered pair notation to show the source of the edge and the destination of the edge. So the edge always travels from v1 to v2. And that's why we had this whole discussion about how v1, v2 is not the same edge as v2, v1. They're completely different edges because this would say that there's an edge going from v2 to v1. Completely different piece of information there. So that in this case, the order does matter for directed edges, which is why we've been using ordered pair notation. Now I want to direct your attention to a uh, graph with undirected edges, something like this. And note that we're still using ordered pair notation here, v1, v2, which if this is a director graph, we would assume that this is an edge going from v1 to v2, but again, this is an undirected edge. So there's no really sense of enforced direction going on here. I want to give what hopefully is a satisfactory explanation for why this is true. Uh, probably it won't be, but you know, I'm willing to live with that consequence. So I think part of the reason why we're okay using ordered pair notation here is that when you have an undirected edge, then yes, you can still facilitate travel along the edge from V1 to V2. It just happens to be that you can also facilitate edge travel from V2 to V1. So in a graph where we know it's undirected, then we can, we're still fine establishing an edge like this. We just also have the understanding that, oh, well, we also have travel from V2 to V1. So we can consider, so we can consider this ordered pair to be significant both ways, in both directions, I suppose. I think the other reason, and probably this is the big reason why ordered pair notation still sticks around for undirected graphs, is basically because we already use we already use ordered pair notation for directed edges, and people probably just didn't want to really change it up for undirected graphs, because that causes a lot of confusion. If you use one notation for one type of graph and another notation for another type of graph, things tend to get confused, and we want to minimize that as much as possible. So it appears, I would imagine that it's the best choice to just stick with ordered pair notation for undirected graphs and kind of deal with the consequences of maybe 10 minutes of confusion before people just accept it and move on from there. So we're totally fine. So we're just going to have to live with the fact that undirected graphs use directed sort of ordered pair notation, but you know, that's life sometimes, you know, sometimes, sometimes the answers aren't always satisfactory. So our next topic is relations, and don't worry, we'll bring this back to the whole ordered and tuple definition that we just talked about. But a relation is basically going to take two non-empty sets, which we'll call A and B, and it's basically just going to map elements of A to elements of B. So in this example here, I'm defining A to be 1, 2, 3, 4, and B to be the set containing A, E, C, and D. The way we can define a relation is talk about how that relation moves an element from A into an element of B. So a very quick and easy way of doing that is to just describe a relation as a set of transformations, which can be represented sort of how we represent directed edges by using ordered tuples in order to show where the relation maps from and maps to. So one example, so you can make relation R sub 1. It's going to be a set of transformations. So in this case, let's say it maps one to A, one to B, two to D, three to D, and four to B. So as you can see, when we're talking about relations, we are actually allowed to have a relation that maps one thing in A to multiple things in B, and 
we can have a relation that maps two things in A to one thing in D. So that's totally fine. A relation, we're just mapping stuff together without really much of regard for how those things are mapped together. So if you want a visual example of how this relation is working, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the set A sort of like this. I'm going to draw the set B sort of like this. Where the points, uh, where these uh, circles are going to represent the sets, the points are actually going to represent the elements in the set. And what I'll do is I'll draw arrows based on how this relation defines the uh, mappings. So I'll draw an arrow from 1 to A, an arrow from 1 to B, an arrow from 2 to D, an arrow from 3 to D, and an arrow from 4 to B. Now something that's really interesting is that C hasn't been touched at all by the relation. There's nothing mapping anything in set A to the element C. And that's also totally fine. There's no restriction on how many elements of each set are mapped to or mapped from. There's no many, there's no restrictions on how many times each element is mapped to or from. I, this is totally fine for just relations. So it's a very broad classification of transform of ways you can transform elements of A to elements of B. So here's another small example of a relation. We have the same sets A and B. We're defining our relation R2 to just be the transformations from 1 to C, 1 to D, and 2 to A. So that's what this looks like all drawn out like this. So here we have our non-empty sets, and we have a diagram that represents what a relation does. And what I want to do is I actually want to take this diagram and extrapolate the definition of that relation from it. So I want to be clear here that if I ask you to give a certain relation, giving the diagram like this is not actually going to be sufficient. I actually want you to give the relation in sort of the set of ordered pairs form that we've been talking about for the past two examples. So if you want to give a definition for that relation based on a diagram like this, then you'll do something like the process I'm about to do right here. So we'll first create the start of a set because a relation is really just a set of transformations. And then we'll just go and follow these arrows and see how this works. So we'll start at one and follow this arrow down here and it takes us to C. So we can say that one C is our first transformation. Then we have two, and that takes us down to D. So we have two D. Three will then take us up to B. And just like that, we can write that down. And four will take us to A. So four A, just like that. And now this is the relation that is described by this diagram like so. So relations are useful. It's useful to talk about processes that transform elements of one set into elements of another set, but we can actually get even more specific. So we have a series of sort of sub definitions of relations that describe different constraints on a relation. So on what a relation is allowed to map from and map to, and how many times a relation is allowed to map from and map to things. So I think the broadest sort of subcategory of relation is what's called a function. So a function is really just a type of relation. And for each element of A, and that element is mapped exactly to one element in B. So here's an example of a function. We can take a look and see that every element of A shows up in exactly one ordered pair of our function. So our function only has one transformation for every element of A, which is exactly what we want. So here what I've done is I have drawn out the diagram for this function. And as you can see over here, each element of A has exactly one arrow coming out of it, which means that this is a function. It doesn't matter that C isn't touched at all by an arrow. It doesn't matter that A has two arrows pointing towards it. We don't care about that. All that 
all that matters for a function is that every element of A has one arrow coming out of it. Or what that mean, really means is that every element of A is involved in one transformation in this function. So I want to take a look at this relation here and note that I have changed the sets A and B to now be A being 2, 4, and 6, and B being 1, 2, 7, and 10. So as you can see here, this relation has, sends 2 to 1, 2 to 2, 6 to 1, and 4 to 10. If I draw out the arrows in this diagram here, we'll see that 2 goes to 1, 2 goes to 2, 6 goes to 1, and 4 goes to 10. Now the problem that we have here is that 2 has two arrows coming out of it, which means that 2 is involved in two transformations here, which this is not allowed by our definition of a function. By definition of a function, every element in A must have only one arrow coming out of it, or every element in A can only be involved in one transformation. So this, this is a relation, but it's not a function. Now let's take a look at one more relation and see why it's not a function. So here we have 2 being pointed towards 10, and we have 6 being pointed towards 1. And as you can see, 4 is not involved in any of these transformations. And we've sort of displayed that by showing no arrow coming out of 4. Now, like we mentioned before, this is totally fine for a relation, but our definition of function says that every element of A has to have one arrow coming out of it. it must be involved in exactly one transformation. So because 4 isn't associated with any element in B through our relation, then this relation cannot be a function. So hopefully those examples were illuminating on some of the differences between what makes a relation a function and what makes a relation not able to be a function. Okay, so I want to return to the definition of function. So when we say that f is a function from A to B, what we're really saying is f is an object that takes any element from A and transforms it into an element from B. So when we have our example function earlier, what I normally like to do is I like to draw a box right in the middle of A and B and label this with f1 in this case, because that's what we named our function. So what, we're what I'm trying to show is that f1 sort of takes the objects from A and, turn and makes them undergo a process that turns them into objects from B. So say if we grab, if f1 grabs one, it's going to make it undergo a process that turns one into A. If it grabs two, it will undergo a process that will turn two into A, and so on and so on. But I do really want to emphasize that f1 is indeed an object. Every function is an object. And at some point in the quarter, we will talk about how to work with those objects. So in not too long from now, we'll start seeing some operators, in fact, that will actually take in two functions and give us a completely new function. So stay tuned for that. But I really want to get it out there that functions are indeed objects. In fact, you can also say that functions are discrete objects. So basically what we have here is we have a definition of our function in terms of set notation. So because we can use a set to define a function, and that set uses ordered pairs, which are also discrete objects, then we have that functions are in, are in fact a discrete object. So keep that in mind. But we'll do plenty of work with functions, with transforming functions, with smashing functions together later on once we get through the basics of functions here. But back to this slide over here. When we say that f is a function from a to b, we can write that symbolically as f colon, a, arrow, b. And we can read this quite literally as f is a function from a to b. So if you see me write down something like this when I'm giving an example function, this quite literally means f is a function from a to b. Now, I do want to put out there that the definition of function and understanding this notation is probably one of the most important definitions we'll be talking about this entire quarter. So please make sure you know it. I'm more than happy to go over it as much as possible if people are having trouble with the definition of a function, but understanding what a function is 
And what makes any relation a function is really important because later on we'll be talking about more advanced types of functions and actually relying a lot on the definition of a function. So because of that, it's really important to remember what a function is. So I would, so bookmark the page of your notes where you talk about the definition. So do whatever you need to remember what the definition of a function is or so that you can very easily get back to the definition of a function in your notes. Now, if we have some element little a in big A and some element little b in big B, we can say that if f maps a to b, little a to little b in this case, we can use the notation f applied to a equals b. And this should be pretty familiar from when you were working in classes like algebra, calculus, all that kind of stuff. So furthermore, if f maps a to b, then we say that b is the image of a under f, or basically we have transformed a into b using the function f. There's a similar definition here that says that a is the pre-image of b under f. And what this says is that b is mapped to by a under f. And I guess I shouldn't say a is the pre-image of b. I should say that a is a pre-image of b under f. So a is one of possibly many pre-images of b under f. And that's going to be important to know for, say, our example here. When we have that 1 and 2 both map to a, we would say that 1 and 2 are both pre-images of a under f1. So any element in b can have multiple pre-images under f1, but since we're working with functions here, any element in a will have exactly one image under f1. One last definition we can make is that if we're saying our function f goes from the set a to the set b, then we'll call a the domain of f, and b will be the codomain of f. Now the difference between codomain and range, we'll talk. We'll be able to talk a little bit more precisely when we actually get a little bit more math techniques under our belt. But right now you can think of the range as all of the elements in B that can be reached by F, or in the case of our diagrams, all of the elements of B that have arrows pointing towards them, whereas the codomain is the entirety of the set. So in our example here, again, we have b, which is the codomain of this function, but the range of this function, so we can say range of f1 is actually going to be the set a, b, and d. So c is not going to be in the range because there's no arrows pointing towards c, or there's no transformations in this function that actually have anything to do with c. So in short, when we say that f is a function from a to b, b is the codomain, not the range, and a is the domain. So in our example of functions and relations so far, all I've done is define functions and relations using that set of ordered pairs notation. But with functions, we actually have other ways of defining them. So let's say we have a function from the integers to the integers. I want to note that it is possible for a function to go from one set to itself. This is totally fine. So we'll have a function f from the integers to the integers defined by f of x equals 2x. So what we have here is we're saying that, well, for every element x in our domain, the output in the codomain is going to be 2 times x. So what we have here is we have we take in any number and we get some sort of even number out of here. So now 
I want you to notice that every value of the codomain is not necessarily reachable by our function. So in this case, we will never touch an odd number with our function in our codomain. Basically, what we're doing is we're defining the output of f for every single element of our domain. So that was our discussion on functions. Thank you all so much for watching. Our next step is we're going to start focusing on a really cool type of function, something called a propositional function or a predicate.